In this video, we're going to focus on finding the inverse function algebraically and also how to graph inverse functions. So let's start with f of x is equal to 3x minus 8. The inverse function is basically a function where the x and y values have been changed or switched. So for example, let's say if f of 4, or rather, f of 3 is equal to 1, then the inverse of 1 is 3. So pretty much, we need to reverse x and y. For the original function, what's inside of the function is x, what's on the outside is y. So then the inverse of y is equal to x. So you simply have to reverse it, but how can we apply this to a problem? So how can we find the inverse function of 3x minus 8? The first thing that you need to do is replace f of x with y. And the next step, switch x and y. And then solve for y. So let's add 8 to both sides. x plus 8 is equal to 3y. And now let's divide both sides by 3. So x plus 8 divided by 3 is y. So this is the inverse function, which we can represent it using uh, the inverse notation. So it's x plus 8 divided by 3. So that's how you can find the inverse function of a linear function. Now what about this one? Let's say f of x is equal to 2x plus 5 divided by 3x minus 1. Feel free to pause the video and go ahead and find the inverse function of this rational function. So just like before, we're going to replace f of x with y. And in the next step, we're going to switch y with x. And now let's solve for y. So x is the same as x over 1. Let's cross multiply. So 1 times 2y plus 5 is 2y plus 5. And x times 3y minus 1, let's distribute the x, so it's 3yx minus 3x. To solve for y, we need to get y by itself on one side of the equation. So let's move 3x to the left and 2y to the right. So it's going to be 3x plus 5. If it's negative 3x on the right side, it's going to be positive 3x on the left. On the right side, we're going to have 3yx minus 2y. Now to isolate y, you want to factor it from the 3yx minus 2y. Take out the GCF. So 3yx divided by y is 3x. Negative 2y divided by y is negative 2. The left side is going to be the same. Now our next step is to divide both sides by 3x minus 2. So now we have y by itself, which we can replace it with the inverse function. So the inverse function is equal to 3x plus 5 divided by 3x minus 2. Try this one. Let's say if we have a square root function. Go ahead and find the inverse of this function. And at the same time, find the domain and range. So let's replace y with f of x. And then let's switch x and y. Now to get rid of the radical, we need to square both sides. So on the left is simply x squared. On the right, the radical, which has an index number of 2, is canceled by the square of 2. So x squared is equal to 2y minus 6. So to solve for y, to get it by itself, we need to add 6 to both sides. So we have x squared plus 6 is equal to 2y. And then we need to divide by 2. So we can see that the inverse function is 
x squared, or 1 half x squared, plus 6 divided by 2, which is 3. So I divided each of these numbers by 2 separately. So now, what is the domain and range for the original function? To find the domain, the inside part of the square root has to be equal to or greater than 0. So 2x has to be equal to or greater than 6. And if you divide by 2, x is equal to or greater than 3. So therefore, the domain is from 3 to infinity. Now, what about the range of the original function? What's the range? The square root will never give you a negative number. The lowest value that it can be is 0. It could be anywhere from 0 to infinity, but it won't be negative. So the range is going to vary from 0 to infinity. If you plug in 3 into the equation, 2 times 3 is 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. The square root of 0 is 0. You get this number. Now, if you plug in a very large number, like infinity, into x, you're going to get infinity, or another large number. Now, it turns out that to find the domain and range of the inverse function, you simply have to switch them. The range for f of x is the domain for the inverse function. And the range for the inverse is basically the domain for the original function. So they're simply opposites of each other. You just have to switch the range and the domain. Now let's talk about this. If we graph f of x, which is a radical function that starts at 3, it's going to look like this. Now, if we graph the inverse function, it appears to be a parabola, which, notice that it's three units up. And this parabola will look like this. But notice that the inverse function, or the inverse part of this parabola, is only just this region. If you take this function and you change if you switch the x and y values, you're only going to get the right portion of this graph. And as you can see, there's symmetry across the line y equals x. So the domain for the square root function, you can see that it starts from 3 and it goes to infinity. Here's 3 all the way to the right is infinity. The range for the the 1 half x squared plus 3 function, you can see that y starts at 3 and it goes to infinity. So the range is 3 to infinity. Now the range for the square root function, the lowest y value is 0 and it goes up to positive infinity. The domain for the right half portion of this function if you look at the x values, the lowest x value is 0, and it goes all the way to the right to infinity. So the domain is from 0 to infinity. So you need to remember that the inverse function for f of x is just the, the right side portion of this graph. If you graph the entire thing, then the domain will no longer be from 0 to infinity. It's going to be from negative infinity to infinity but it wouldn't be the inverse. Only this portion is the inverse of this function. Try this one. Find the inverse function for the cube root of x minus 4 plus 1. So let's replace f of x with y. And then let's switch x and y. And then let's solve for y. So let's subtract both sides by 1. So x minus 1 is equal to the cube root of y minus 4. Now to get rid of the radical, we need to raise both sides to the third power. 
so that the threes will cancel. So on the left, we have x minus 1 raised to the third power. On the right, it's simply y minus 4. So now let's add 4 to both sides. So x minus 1 to the third power plus 4 is equal to y. So therefore, the inverse function is x minus 1 raised to the third power plus 4. Now, if you have a cube root function, the domain and range is all real numbers. So for this cubic function that we have here, the same is true for the domain and range. It's all real numbers. There's no restriction on this type of graph. So if you have a radical with an even index number, you cannot have a negative number inside the radical. So it's restricted. But if it's an odd number, x could be anything. So there's no restriction on the domain or the range. Let's try this one. So let's say f of x is equal to e to the 3x plus 1 minus 5. Go ahead and find the inverse function. So let's replace f of x with y, and then let's switch x and y. So let's add 5 to both sides. So x plus 5 is equal to e raised to the 3y plus 1. Now to solve for y, we need to bring it down from the exponent position. And to do that, we need to take the natural log of both sides. Natural log of x plus 5 is equal to the natural log of e raised to the 3y plus 1. A property of logs and natural logs allow you to uh, take the exponent and move it to the front. So what we now have is ln x plus 5 on the left, 3y plus 1 on the right times ln e. ln e is equal to 1, so on the right side it's simply 3y plus 1. So now let's subtract both sides by 1, and then after that let's divide both sides by 3. So y is equal to ln x minus 5 minus 1 divided by 3. So we could say that the inverse function is equal to 1 third natural log x minus 5 minus 1 third if we divide each term in the numerator by 3. So if you have y is equal to e to the x, the inverse function is ln x. Now let's graph these two. Let's focus on the parent functions. e to the x looks like this. Natural log, it starts from the y-axis, and it looks like this. As you can see, there's symmetry across the line y equals x, which is typical of inverse functions. Now, what is the domain for the e to the x function? For e to the x, x could be anything. So the domain is from negative infinity to infinity. As you can see, it starts all the way from the left, and it can keep going to the right. Now, the range for a natural log is negative infinity to infinity. It can be any y value. Now, the range for the e to the x function is restricted. The lowest y value for e to the x is 0. The highest is infinity. Notice that it never goes below the x-axis. So the range is from 0 to infinity, but it doesn't include 0, because that's a horizontal asymptote. The domain for the natural log function is 0 to infinity. Notice that the blue line is never to the left of the y-axis. Um, as you can see, the lowest x value is 0, the highest is infinity. So the domain for the regular function f of x is the range for the inverse function. The range 
of f of x is the domain for the inverse function. And it usually works out that way. Now I'm going to give you a graph. And what I want you to do is find the inverse function based on the graph. Now let's say if the first point is at 5 negative or 5 positive 2 and the second one is 2 comma 1 and then 1 negative 5 and negative 2 negative 3. Find the inverse function of this graph. So what you need to do is you need to switch the points. So if the first point is 5 comma 2, you want to plot 2 comma 5, which is over here. Now the second point is 2 comma 1. So you want to plot 1 2, which is over here. Now since 5 2 is connected to 2 1, then 2 5 has to be connected to 1 2. Now the next point, which is 1, negative 5, we need to plot negative 5, 1, which is in this region. So let's connect those two points. And then the last point is negative 2, negative 3. So we get to plot negative 3, negative 2, which is around this area. So that's how you can graph the inverse function using points. So as you can see, we have symmetry across the line y equals x. Now let's say if you're given two functions, f of x, which is the cube root of 2x minus 7, and g of x, which is x cubed plus 7 divided by 2. How can you prove that these two functions are inverses of each other? To prove it, you need to find the composite function f of g of x and show that it's equal to x. And at the same time, you also got to find the other composite function g of f of x and show that it too is equal to x. So let's start with f of g of x. So g is inside of f. So g is the input function, f is the output function. So what we need to do is take the function for g and substitute it into this equation. We need to replace x with x cubed plus 7 divided by 2. So f is this function. It's 2 times what x would be minus 7. So let's take this and insert it here. So we're going to have x cubed plus 7 divided by 2. So the 2's will cancel. And so we're left with the cube root of x cubed plus 7 minus 7. So 7 minus 7 is 0. So now we're left with the cube root of x cubed. The 3's will cancel. So the final answer is x. So now we just got to prove it for the other one. So g of f of x. So this time, g, I mean, f is going to be inside of g. So let's start with g. It's x raised to the third power plus 7 divided by 2. So instead of writing x, we're going to replace it with the cube root of 2x minus 7. The 3 will cancel, and so we no longer have the radical. It's just 2x minus 7 plus 7 divided by 2. Negative 7 plus 7 cancels to 0. 
So we're left with 2x divided by 2, which is equal to x. So that's how you can prove if two functions are inverses of each other. Now the next thing that we need to talk about is the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. Consider this graph. Is it a function? To tell if a graph or a curve is a function, use the vertical line test. Notice that the curve touches the vertical line at two points. So this is not a function. Now what about this one? Is this a function? The answer is yes. It touches the vertical line at one point. So this is a function. Let's call it f of x. Now this function, does it have an inverse function? To determine the answer to that question, you have to use the horizontal line test. So because this function touches the horizontal line at one point, that means that there is an inverse function and the inverse function is a function. A function that passes the horizontal line test is said to be a one-to-one -one function. For every x value, there is one y value. And for every y value, you have one x value. So if we want to graph the inverse function, it's going to look like this. You're going to have symmetry across the line y equals x. And as you can see, the inverse function, which is the red line, it passes the vertical line test, which means it's a function. So if f of x passes the horizontal line test, the inverse function will pass the vertical line test, which means the inverse function exists. Now what about this one? Does it have an inverse function? Notice that it does not pass the horizontal line test because it's not one-to-one. -one. It touches the horizontal line at two points. If you were to draw the inverse function, it would look something like this. Notice that the inverse is not really a function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Because the regular function didn't pass the horizontal line test, the inverse function will not pass the vertical line test, which means the inverse is not really a function. It's not. For every x value, there's at least two y values, so it doesn't work out.